Welcome to the Loadout Music Podcast, featuring intimate conversations with emerging and established musicians. Recorded at the Gaslight Studios in St. Louis. And now your host, Aaron Perlett. Welcome back to the Loadout Music Podcast. I am your host, Aaron Perlett, and you are joining us for episode one of our third season. And I'm joined today by someone I've actually wanted to have on the show for probably about two years now. Her name is Sarah Borges. She's a rocker out of Boston. Sarah, so much. thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Aaron. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. So, you know, I read on your website, it said, she's a busy single mom who doesn't have time for your bullshit. She's an <laughs> unapologetic stage belcher. So apparently you've got a lot of gas going on, right? You're, you belch on stage. You know... I, I used to be a heavy drinker and yeah. I, I, part of that is like beer gives you the burps, you know, and I kind of crafted some tricks, but now I think people get disappointed because I don't drink anymore and I can't like club soda just doesn't do it. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, as a reformed drinker myself, uh, I can confirm that it, uh, the beer does give you the burps, but I was happy just switching to, um, you know, red wine or whiskey or whatever. It really didn't matter. I was, you know, I, I didn't discriminate <laughs> before I quit. No, nor did I. I'm surprised I didn't hit the rubbing alcohol. You know? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I did some hard drinking. I like to say I just drank all the drinks early. I quit when I was, a, when my son was, golly, four and he's 10 now. So it's been about six years. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, having gone through that, I, th I quit about three years ago and my, my, my kids are uh, almost 19 and 17 respectively. And I always tell myself and my wife that I wish I would have stopped um, probably about 10 years prior when they were, you know, too young to remember. But, uh, you know, we, we learn our lessons and you move on and you just try to be better for it and do what works for you. And clearly drinking did not work for you nor I. <laughs> no, but I think there's value in talking to your kids, you know, early and often about substances, be it alcohol or drugs, especially with fentanyl being just so friggin' common everywhere. Um, that those conversations need to be had really early, unfortunately, with kids and sharing your experience, whether it be that you had a problem with it or it just didn't agree with you is valuable, you know, for your kids when it's appropriate to tell them that, I think. Yeah, I, and I did the exact same thing. I mean, uh, I know we're supposed to be talking about music here, but I, you know, I used um, my, my challenges with drinking as teaching moments for my kids. And you're right. I mean, today, a lot of the weed you buy in the street is laced with fentanyl and um, you don't know what's out there. And, uh, you know, that's why sometimes I'm actually thankful for the states that, um, that, that, sell marijuana legally because at least you know exactly what's in it it's regulated and uh there's not something in there that's going to absolutely creep up on you and kill you i know i mean i also think about it from a monetary perspective you know we play the tax here when we go to the dispensary in massachusetts the state where it's legal but wouldn't it be great if all those tax dollars were going to i don't know education or something you know not so covert and cash business only and have to have high security and can't use the banking system and <laughs> yeah i mean look you know the federal government seems to be missing out on a grand opportunity to uh to you know find a revenue stream at a time when they could really use revenue instead of shutting the banks down they could actually be leveraging that to uh to do something good like maybe fund infrastructure or, you know, get me hair plugs or something like that. Something like that. So, so let's, let's talk more about your career. Cause I'd love to kind of get into what has led you to the point you're at today. Um, I know you, you grew up in Massachusetts um, and you were kind of a musical theater kid, right? Yeah. You know, I was like a really shy kid. I'm an only child. And I think, singing and chorus and choirs and doing like the little plays you do when you're in grade school. It was a way for me to be social and speak up in a way that I didn't feel comfortable doing otherwise. But it is addictive being on stage and having people clap for you. So I think I like got it in at an early age that, oh, if you do something cool on stage, people are going to clap for you and you're going to feel great inside. So I did that, you know, starting from itty bitty and then did it my whole life until I started playing guitar and writing songs and stuff. But 
I just learned a lot about how to like act around other people in a rehearsal or in a performance or how not to step on someone else's part or just invaluable lessons for show and stage stuff. At, at what point do you transition from being a theater kid to picking up guitar, as you mentioned? When you realize it's so much cooler. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I, in Boston in the 90s, indie rock was such a thing. And the bands were getting signed left and right, like Morphine and Buffalo Tom and Throwing Muses and, you know, all these bands that I could see at the clubs on Friday night. And then they were in Gosh Darn Rolling Stone the next day. So it seemed just so accessible. And I was lucky because I wasn't very good. But I don't know if everyone was very good then. It was just this punk rock ethos of like, get up there and play. We'll figure it out later. You know? Yeah, I remember, um, you know, to your point about how cool it is. I remember having a conversation in our first season with uh, John Oates, the Rock and Roll Hall of Famer from Hall of Oates. And um, off, offline, he and I were talking about different guitars and he said, uh, and I was talking to him about different guitars for lead guitar and for rhythm guitar. I said, you know what? It doesn't really matter. It's really about the first thing you want is you want a guitar to make you look cool. So yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, it's totally true. It's I mean, you gotta like not to be heartless about it, but you got to think about the whole package. Like humans are social animals; they respond to bright, shiny things. Like you gotta be realistic too. Well, you know, it's it's interesting though that you know you that you bring this topic up because, you know, when I when I was when I was doing some research for the show, I'm I'm looking through even old photos of you, and it was fascinating to look at kind of the you seem to go through. I don't know if it's a transformation, but the earlier photos I I found you kind of had dresses and things like that, <laughs> and then I saw you getting into more like tank tops where your your tattoos could really was there a progression for you in terms of you know the fashion you were wearing and just trying to be more I don't know maybe you were kind of finding yourself as you were evolving as an artist well I think also going on tour has a lot to do with it and you yeah. can only get so fancy in the back of a van when that's your dressing room you know and yeah. the more and more do it the less or the more you realize it isn't glamorous and I do shave my armpits in the back bench of the van like you know regularly <laughs> um so i think a lot of it had to do with just being on tour it's easier to w dress a certain way that maybe isn't so prim and proper um but w the other part of it is that you know when we first started out we were really lucky that we started out with this label blue corn who we're on now but we made a shift to sugar hill records midway through there and they were like big budget record company it's you know lawrence welk's company so I think there was more money there for hair and makeup and there was more encouragement to sort of look like an Americana queen. And, you know, we've just kind of run the gamut and now yeah. I'm like, screw it. I don't know if it's comfortable and it looks moderately. Okay. We'll go for it. <laughs> so, so yeah. So your first record was really came on the heels of um, a performance you did. I think it was like 2004 down at South by, where people really started noticing you and then ultimately to, then you signed with blue corn and then you put out your first record 2005 right uh, that's it so how did the south by thing comes because you know there's some artists that would just you know give a limb to go play at south by how did that I happen know. did where i mean where, was it you're playing around massachusetts around boston or had you started touring the country at that point we really hadn't. We got super lucky. I was like 23 or 24 and I had just come out of like playing in dumb punk rock bands and indie rock bands in Boston. And I, Americana music was, you know, it was starting to blossom in a way that I noticed both in bands around town playing that style of music and also, you know, publications like No Depression were our Bibles. We wanted to know all about those bands, you know. So, um, I don't know, when I, I started writing music of that ilk, we just got lucky really quick. And we had a DJ friend here on the MIT radio station, which is a great one here in Cambridge, Boston. Um, and she hooked me up with this dude, John Conquest, and he ran a parallel music festival called Third Coast Music um, down in Austin. And it was sort of the home for misfit toys where he'd have bands that he liked played. Um, and people really trust his opinion. So it wasn't even the 
festival proper that I played. It was this parallel festival. And Denby, who's the guy from Blue Corn, happened to be in the audience, really liked it. And then, you know, we, we decided to put out a record like within a couple of weeks of that. So that never happens. That's yeah. like dream stuff. And, I mean, and it is a, a fact that if you deal with a guy named John Conquest, you're either going to be in porn films or you might, you might go play at South by. <laughs> That's a great name. Come on, John. <laughs> he, he is Seth. Since left this mortal coil, God love him, but he's this, he was this British man and he would, um, he rolled his own cigarettes, but he didn't put a filter in. So he'd always have a little tobacco in his teeth and he'd curse and swear. And he is just a love of a man, real music fan and stuff. He was a character, but yeah, yeah. you're right. That name, I, I don't know where to, if maybe that wasn't his real name, probably. <laughs> maybe, right. maybe not. Right. So, so um, You've kind of been through, and I don't think this is really unusual for, for any artist, but you've been through some, uh, it seems like a lot of changes with your band, uh, the Broken Singles, where, you know, originally it was just you, then it was Sarah Borges and the Broken Singles, then it was, you know, uh, just back to you, and it's, has that just been kind of a product of record companies, has it been a product of just the evolving band, what's, what's driven that? You know, for the bulk of my musical career, I've had sort of a partner in crime named Binky, and he's my bass player. And to me, he and I together is the broken singles combination. We have had different drummers and different lead guitar players, but we're the core unit. So I kind of feel like if he's playing, if he's touring, if he's involved, it might be a broken single show, or that's sort of a catch-all term for when we've got, you know, our friends playing with us. But for this new record, I didn't write it with, you know, with people in a great big way. I, none of my regular guys were on the recording, and it was a very sort of, um, uh, self not self-involved but self-examining record because I wrote it during the pandemic we recorded it from home it just felt like this probably is just me not the broken singles instead you know so that flux is you know sometimes unwieldy but it's just really based on who's in the band or on the project yeah and your last record um was love's middle name um mm -hmm. and that actually got a uh, you know, I, for an artist like you that is in a, everyone seems to have trouble, you know, finding a place for you on, on where you fit, which is um, kind of radio in and of itself today, especially with whether it's country music or punk music. And I know that's, that's kind of how people describe you somewhere in between those two. Um, but it's, I, I'd imagine that's a little bit frustrating for you, but that had some, you got a lot of radio play, at least on places like um, Outlaw Country, yeah. uh, but a lot of love's middle name. I know that's where I actually first started listening, or hearing you um, and became aware of you. You know, we got really lucky with Outlaw Country because, you know, there's a couple things at play. One is that we have some friends over in that camp. Like Elizabeth Cook has been really kind to me. She plays my music on the regular and I love her for it. And Mojo Nixon does the same. So we've made, per I don't know why I'm saying we, I've made like personal connections with the folks over there. Um, but yeah, it's been my undoing, not committing to an individual style because, you know, finding everything from finding a touring bill that's appropriate. I think people are relatively short-sighted. I try to look at it like we, we love everybody, you know, we play everything. And so did Tom Petty. It's not that big of a deal, yeah. but I think if we had adhered more strictly to um, what's traditionally thought of as like a female American Americana singer songwriter, I mean, maybe I'd be a millionaire right now. I don't know, but it's just never been calculated. So maybe that's not been the best plan, but that's what we got. Yeah. And I mean, today radio play means something completely different than what it did 20 years ago when radio play was really driving the industry. It was driving record sales, record sales were the driver for revenues. Today it's all about shows playing bigger shows, being a headliner. I mean, it's a much different economic game today. And so, you know, I think of a guy, um, that, there's a guy named Lincoln Durham who we've had on the show who just moved to Boston recently from Austin. He's long thought of himself as kind of a Southern Gothic punk rocker. Similar descriptives follow him somewhere between punk and country. 
Um, again, ironically, he's now living in Boston. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think there's, there's so many really, really talented musicians today that don't fit into, uh, you, know, you know, they don't necessarily fit into one little corner. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because I think it helps, doesn't it help you bring in a broader fan base? You know, I, that's how I would think of it too. Yeah. And it, it's sometimes proven to be true. Americana fans are, you know, they love big and they have a wide scope of interests. So in that particular genre, we do okay. But when you start to get into like AAA radio and then there's not a follow-up single to what our AAA single sounds like. And um, I think streaming, you know, obviously sucks because we get paid nothing and it's an unnatural way to listen to music, whether it be song by song or in some playlist that you've made. But it also does help artists like us where, you know, maybe you heard a song of ours on some algorithm mix because it was like something else and that led you to our deeper catalog or something. I'm hoping that it's working that way. Well, if there's one thing that though that I've noticed that is very consistent about your music, it's that your music sounds really good when you, I mean you need to play your music loud. That's right. when you that's when you really get a sense for who you are as an artist. I mean, there's not a lot of ballads in your catalog. No. <laughs> um, no, well, I, going back to, you know, musical theater, again, like, I think when you're playing or singing and you're having to dance and act and maybe play in front of an orchestra too, you just develop this really big gut muscle for singing over drums. I'm a really loud singer. And so my voice is best served for those like burners where it's like, you know, it's loud, it's energetic and people really like that. So I like a good ballad, don't get me wrong, but just writing wise, it's, for me, it's a lot easier to write those rock songs. Yeah, I mean, most years as I went through your catalog, um, and you know what, on a streaming service, it's really hard to find to follow your catalog because they put you in different groups because, you know, they have the and with the ampersand. I know. And, and then just you. Um, but I mean, it's a lot of bangers. And then you've got the occasional one like, oh, Victoria, I guess you could call that a ballad to a degree. But for the most part, I mean, you know, I, I found it most easiest to listen to when I just turn the radio up very loud and you get a real great sense for who you are and what you like to do. Yeah. I'm, you know, there's so joy is at such a premium in life that I feel like every show is an opportunity for us to have a party and invite people. They, they've paid their price of admission and now we're all going to hang out and listen to music that I play and that I pick. It's like, I'm the DJ. It's so fun. So we strive for that. Like, you know, communal enjoyment thing every night. It's definitely not like, you're not gonna get shushed at the show, probably. Probably. Uh, <laughs> out, of the, out of the question. <laughs> well, you know, and it's funny, on your website, you mentioned joy. Um, I, I read that in the, in the bio for you that joy fits the bill, that, that joy is a really important part of how you approach your craft. Yeah. You know, I, I going back to drinking, but for so long that sapped my life of joy. And um, at the time I was like going through a divorce, I had a young child. And I think prior to those experiences, which were so hard and life-changing, we just toured and drank beer and had a great time. And I wasn't necessarily like grateful for every single friggin' minute, which I am now because especially with the pandemic, when we go out and play a show, like this could be the last one for two years or ever. Yeah. Um, and so just everything, even like the shitty food they give us from the bar or whatever, like it's great. It's great. You know, because these are the things you're going to think about on your deathbed probably. <laughs> That's great. It's great. We're joined by Sarah Borges today on the loadout. This is, of course, episode one of season three. So, Sarah, talk about you've got a, a new record you're working on, you're, you're releasing. Um, talk about that. When is it going to be available? Um, how does it differentiate itself from, from your past work? Uh, give us a sense of what we're, we're going to be hearing. Yeah, well, the record's called Together Alone. It's out February 18th of 2022, um, and people can, you know, pre-order if they so choose and listen if they so choose on streaming services as we release singles but the record was re recorded primarily during the lockdown so 
my longtime producer, Eric Gamble, kind of devised this way where I'd like come up with a song idea, play it into my phone. He'd pop it into Pro Tools, send it back to me. I did a lot of singing in my closet. Um, but except for three songs, all of the songs are recorded from afar by people, you know, in Nashville and California and Chicago. And we never were together because we couldn't be. So not only did that make for an interesting story for the record, but it also lent a certain cast to the songs because a lot of them were about that feeling. Like, what am I doing? Am I wasting my life? Will things ever get better? What is happening here? Those were subjects that I really addressed in the record. And so having to make it in that way that, you know, so clearly demonstrated the situation we were in, I think it was all of a piece of what the record's like. So, so thematically, we should expect things about, I mean, about kind of that sense of isolation. Is that, uh, is that where you're going with it? Yeah. You know, there's, there's, I'm trying to think of the scope of the songs, but it starts off with a song called Wasting My Time, which I wrote, um, you know, right when we locked down. And I was like, well, I guess there's no more money. There's no more money coming ever <laughs> because an unemployment hadn't been thing yet. And it was just me saying, has all of this career stuff and music stuff I've been working on been for naught? Am I gonna, my son and I are gonna like rot on the vine here because we're locked in our house. So it was, you know, feelings like that. Like I can't go out and do what I'm really want to do or I'm supposed to be doing career wise. And that feels horrible. So, you know, that's the top of the record. And then the record closes with a song, the title track called Together Alone. And it's just sort of my description of, you know, what it feels like to miss somebody both in an abstract way and in a very specific way um, and to miss a whole bunch of people um, and what that feels like. So there's a lot of arcs that happen in between the first and the last song of the record. But I think that really is the overarching theme of the of Together Alone. Yeah, even the title of the thing suggests it. From a composition standpoint, were you able to sense all the pieces were kind of put together virtually to a degree with you there. And uh, isn't Eric in New York? He's um, in um, And whether you had musicians elsewhere, uh, but were you able to make it kind of the banger that is that people who know your music would, would expect, or is it, does it have a different feel to it? Some of the songs are total bangers. Part of that is just the, personnel of musicians we got who are like-minded you know who know how to play a rock song and or who want to play a rock song but also who were I think at the time suffering from that same feeling of missing playing music and wanting to you know do something be aggressive move forward in some way and that translated I think in how they played too you know so um, I don't think it the record lacked you wouldn't know we recorded mm. it apart but I know, you know, yeah. and, um, and that's okay. I kind of made my peace with it. And that's the whole record has just been about like, we're just going to roll along and whatever happens, we're going to make it work to our advantage or we're going to talk about it. Um, so if it lent, if the people being in different parts of the country lent the album a different feel, that's okay too. You know, this is where we are right now. So what's, have you gotten back to a, a regular touring schedule at all? Are you, or are you about to, what's, what is, what's the deal with you and touring? It's so hard because I, you know, politically, socially, I'm very um, liberal and I really take the virus seriously. And I also have a 10 year old yeah. who is double vaccinated, but not boosted because it can't be. So, you know, and I've had COVID once. I just, I want to do it the right way. I want everyone to be safe. We canceled our shows for January and February because it, it's just not, um, you know, conscientious to put a bunch of people sure. in the same room right now. But after that, if, if everything science and Dr. Fauci and folks are telling us is true and what the sort of arc of this next variant is going to look like hopefully we'll be okay to tour a little bit later than we planned but yeah I mean we're going to do the outlaw country cruise supposedly which is put on by Sirius XM but that's yeah. the end of the worry and I don't know I don't know you know it's minute to minute here <laughs> yeah yeah it's you know I, I it's um 
I think there, were, there was a lot of publicity about when touring got shut down during the real heart of COVID, uh, 2020 into 21, early 21, about like road crews and things like that. But there was also a lot of, uh, you know, mid-major artists that weren't the people that were sitting on piles and piles of money that, you know, are single moms and can't necessarily afford to kind of sit out for a year and a half right? <laughs> when you've got, a, you know, mouths to feed. And I mean, that's got to, you know, I, I guess that's got to be a challenging time to try to put joy first when you're just, you're thinking to yourself, okay, I got bills to pay. It's funny we should be talking today because yesterday I took a job during the pandemic as a delivery driver for a courier service. And I figured I've got this huge touring van, why not be putting it to use and driving stuff around? And it really runs the gamut from like dialysis machines to flowers on Valentine's Day or like COVID tests to computer parts. And so that's what I do when I'm home or when I don't have my son when he's with his dad. But I worked a straight 24 overnight last night. And, you know, the comparison of doing that versus being paid the same amount to go play for 45 minutes. Like if you want a lesson in joy, just do that a few times because there's not a lot of joy in my crappy delivery job. And my real job that I love is to make people happy. Like what could be a better job than that? You know? So I try to really think of it that way. Yeah. I can only imagine. I mean, um, uh, you know, I've, I've actually talked to a couple of the musicians on the show that have a side gig that has something that sustains them. Um, and so they, they felt like they were in decent shape, at least when, when touring just stopped. But I would think even now could be to a degree even more frustrating because it, it's almost like you've got that carrot right in front of you and, yeah. and you're ready, you're ready to go. Everything's booked. You've got a tour set up, you know, your booking agents got you playing six nights in a week. And then it gets yanked back. And I mean, Lucinda yeah. Williams just um, canceled a bunch of shows. She was supposed to be here this week, actually. It, that's got to be soul crushing to a degree. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, you're not wrong. You know, it totally is. I, I keep trying to think of it like in a patient way and realize that as artists and promoters are canceling shows, they're trying to make a judgment call about what's the safest for everyone. So later on down the line, we can continue but it's a value judgment so much of the time in the moment. Like we could play the show. It's not illegal, but will anyone come? And if someone's sick there and everyone gets sick, that happens a lot. You know, so-and-so was at your show on Friday. Oh, they got COVID. Now five people are sick. Like, I just don't want to be responsible for that. You know? So it is soul crushing in a way. And, you know, as we start to maybe pivot to like, maybe we're going to live with this virus for a while, as opposed to it being like, rah, 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 we're going to beat it right now. Like, I think realistically, it's going to be around for a little bit. We have to be sensitive to like, it's just, it's in flux all the time. I don't know. I wish there was like touring insurance so you could somehow get paid for all those dates you missed, but alas, that doesn't work that way. Like the bullshit ones that the airlines <laughs> tell you get, and then when you call them and they say, no, that doesn't qualify, you're like, oh, then I paid you $100 for nothing. That's great. Yeah. Oh, yes. Airlines. Well, I mean, we're beholden to everything. Like, we're thinking about doing some shows coming up, and it's like, will we even be able to get there on a plane? Because there's so many, just the infrastructure is shaking because of the pandemic. Yeah. I've, um, I sat in airports last week for uh, a couple hours, both going to and from. Uh, I've got a, a kid I'm about to send back to college on an airplane and I'm wondering if his flight's even going to get there. So it's uh, it's kind of a crapshoot right now. And I think, you know, uh, nobody really knows what to um, to make of what my wife would call Omicromion or what we'd all call Omicron um, and, and, and the impact it's having because, I mean, it seems to be kind of almost like COVID light unless you are not vaccinated and nobody knows how long it's going to be. Some people that have had it say, hey, it's just like a head cold, but you still have to hunker down. And there's just so much unknown. I know. I know. I mean, it, it's a real reality check for humans, I hope. Or I can't even speak for other humans other than the ones I know or that live in right around me. But like, I think we're really confident, you know, like 
we got it all under control, capitalism works, screw the environment, whatever. But we need a wake up call every once in a while that like you mess too much with this shit and things are gonna happen. Just natural, you can't control nature and we think we've got it all down, but we don't. We were talking to Sarah Borges on the Loadout Music podcast. Sarah, uh, it also should be noted that this is the first episode where I've ever worn a jacket. So um, that's, that's important. Third season, I'm freezing where I'm sitting right now. So I decided I'm going to wear a jacket. And it's not really helping me in any way because my hands are still just frozen. But uh, so um, it goes. I have my pajamas on from the waist down. That's, so. <laughs> that's good. You know what? I think you might be the first guest ever to wear pajamas on the show. So that's... Um, I'm not wearing pajamas on the top though, because I, I if I hadn't confessed to you, you wouldn't know. <laughs> you, I, I certainly would not. So, um, you know, looking back at your career, uh, I mean, you've kind of been at it 20 years now. Yeah. Uh, talk about for you, some of the highlights. I'm sure there's been times where maybe you've gotten open shows for people that you just were like, holy shit. This is someone I've always admired, but what have been the real highlights of your, uh, for you personally, of your career? You know, a lot of them have to do with my family. And I think, you know, a lot of people in bands suffer from that complex of like, my family wishes I would get a real job. And mine's not like that. You know, they're, uh, my mom is very supportive and stuff, but it's also nice to be able to show them some kind of return. So we played at the, at the, the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville for the Americana Honors and we got nominated here for an award. So it was like us and like Jason Isbell and Justin Towns Earl, you know, and John Fogarty and my parents flew down. Everyone stayed in Nashville. We had a party um, and just have, being able to have that tangible result of your hard work was very gratifying. Um, and even just seeing my family at shows or my friends at shows and watching them have fun or watching them sing along, you know, those are, those are personal highlights. I think professionally, like I played with a lot of people that I really admire and, you know, Eric Gamble is a really great example. I knew him peripherally and really thought he was pretty awesome. And now he produces my records and we play together. So if I can step a couple steps back and look at where I've gotten to, I'm pretty psyched, you know? And every day is, I have no idea what will happen every day, especially in the pandemic. We could be like on a cruise ship or we could be home for the next year. I really don't know. But that's what makes it thrilling. And your parents, when they came down, they're like, and who is this Jason Ish, Ishbel, Ish, Ishbel? It's uh, Jason Isbell and he's, pretty much the greatest songwriter of the past 15 years. And <laughs> well, you know, and not only that, but going back to what you had brought up about, you know, on the totem pole, we're pretty low, but he's pretty high. And he's the way he's done his business and the way he runs his career is, I think, admirable. He's always on the mark with what he says publicly, especially political stuff. He came out yesterday and criticized the Opry because they had that big old racist Morgan Wallen or Whalen who used the N word publicly and the Grand Old Opry invited him to play. And Jason Isbell called them out and was like, you had a chance here and you blew it. Um, but when people started going back only for shows, he was really in the forefront because he can, people don't want to do that for shows. There's a hundred more people that'll buy those tickets. So he really put his footprint on like, if we want to have shows, you got to wear a mask. You got to have a vaccination card. And people didn't like it, but it was very brave, I thought. Yeah, I remember when he and his wife turned in their membership cards for the uh, uh, the CMAs when they did not recognize John Prine and Jerry Jeff Walker when they passed. And um, I thought it was pretty bold because, you know, you, you could make the argument that neither of them were country singers and they're very much Americana singers, but they had an, a huge influence on anyone who wrote a song with a, with an acoustic guitar, both of them. And, uh, and the, the two of them were both remarkable songwriters and did have um, unquestionably had influence on a lot of great country artists. Um, and for, for not to be recognized that year when they were going through, you know, the posthumous list was kind of silly, but to your point, you know, the next day, I think Jason had his CMA card or something like that. Uh, and he was showing how he was cutting it or something like that. Right. 
Right. Well, I think, you know, I can, I can sort of speak more specifically about the John Prime, but you got to recognize when people have like a, you know, a lifeline to what makes human beings tick. It's so rare. They're prophetic. They're feeling, they can say things we can't say. And that's so important. And there's not a lot of people who can do that. And especially in the like vapid world of new country, like an injection of that would have been amazing. And they totally blew it, you know? Yeah, it was a, it was a real disappointment. They, they forgot a few really important names that year. So Sarah Borges, you've got a new record about to come out. Hopefully you're going to get back on the road at the end of February. Yeah, we'll start. We're going to start if everything was old times or normal, if there's such a thing, um, we would have started the day that record comes out. But we're going to be a little smarter and just kind of ride this pandemic wave. And we're definitely going to tour hardcore for the record. It just might be a little bit later than one would hope. Yeah. So um, before I let you go, let us know where once you get on tour in theory you you might be going to some place in the country that are planned so we 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 don't often get to california because it's so far it's so far um but our typical routes are eastern seaboard so from the whole east coast all the way down to florida we do the mid-atlantic states and then my other favorite run is our midwest run so we'll get as far as omaha or so and come on back st louis Think you Same with our, off Broadway. That's our, one of our favorite places to play. I, I have played that stage myself. It's a phenomenal uh, venue. They've got great sound there, and I love playing on that stage. So uh, it does not suck and in any way. And the good guys, too. You know, like, I feel like that's what we're looking for. Like, I know him when I see him, one of the good ones, and he's one of the good ones. Yeah, there's a lot of great clubs in the Midwest, and uh, I, it, even, you know, all across the country, you know, that that's great. So East Coast, up and down through the Midwest out to Nebraska, you said o- Omaha? Omaha, I, th- I love Omaha. It gets a bad rap as being boring, but it's a hopping little place. Oh, Omaha is a killer town. And I, I remember an evening there when I had, before I quit drinking, that is one of the examples in my mind of why I needed to quit drinking, so. <laughs> I have one like that too from <laughs> Omaha. It involves um, having a set of like vampire teeth and throwing them in people's beers in a bar. I don't know why I was doing that. I still think, every time I think of the word Omaha, I think, oh, I can't believe I did that. But then I get over it. I remember walking into a bar there that had a bunch of big trophies and I decided I'm gonna walk out with one of those trophies. And so I walked <laughs> out with one of those trophies and I shortly felt like an asshole the, day, the next morning. So uh, again, we all make mistakes and you learn from them and try to be uh, better mammals uh, on the back end, so. Yeah, forgiveness of yourself is uh, is pretty key. I'm terrible at that, although I don't know if people that don't know the inside of my head would really recognize that. Either way, Sarah Borges, thank you so much for joining us on the Loadout Music Podcast. It has been a real honor to have you, and uh, hopefully, you know, we can have you back again one time. Maybe when you're in St. Louis, we can do one of these in person with some live performance. That would be fantastic, Aaron. Thank you so much for having me. Happy New Year, and um, keep on doing the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, folks, if you made it this far, and judging by our numbers, you haven't, thanks for listening to the Loadout Music Podcast. You can always find us at loadoutmusic.com and wherever you like to get your podcasts, like iTunes or SoundCloud. And, of course, as always, thanks to Gaslight Studios for hosting us. Have a good one.